everyone. Welcome to uh, this Wednesday evening's Crosstalk as we uh, prepare to hear God's Word on Sunday. We're going through our series of uh, eight stories from the Old Testament, eight stories from uh, the New Testament that are essential to know. And also paralleling that, we're thinking about a life shaped by Scripture and how do these stories uh, inform our life, shape our lives, and then to take a closer look at the stories themselves and to pick out a theme uh, of how a person's life is, is shaped by a biblical truth, biblical reality. And so this week our study is on the book of Daniel and the theme is a life uh, shaped by prayer. So Nathaniel, when I think of the life of Daniel, you're gonna be leading us in the, the service. Uh, what do you usually think of when you think of the book of Daniel? Sure. Well, um, the, the scripture lesson, the Bible story that we're actually going to use as our, um, our, our scripture lesson is probably the big one, and it's Daniel and the lion's den. And um, that's probably number one on most people's list. Daniel and the lion's den, I also think of some of Daniel's friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and the fiery furnace. Um, then toward the end of the book, you get a lot of these visions of the future. We hear a lot about the uh, book of Daniel in prophecy conferences, prophecy teaching. So there's this sort of, um, uh, these big stories, big ideas floating around. But what are we going to be looking at, uh, particularly on, on Sunday? Right. Well, um, you kind of alluded it to just a second ago. Um, and you've probably picked up on this as we've, we've done the series. We're using very specific stories uh, out of specific people's lives. So, for example, we um, used a specific story of Elijah waiting for God at uh, Mount Sinai. Um, but in, in studying that one story, what we're actually doing is looking at this whole person's life and how does this lifelong formation show up in this one particular story? Right. So it's, it's you know, this idea that we're going to be looking at in a series coming um, in the fall, virtue ethics, this yeah. idea that um, we don't react uh, in a moment uh, just out of a, a inspiration, but we react in a moment out of a lifelong formation. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's the formation that comes through in times of stress. And so you're saying that as we look at these stories, these lives have had, had this long shaping that yeah. brings them to this point. Um, I would say that for me, the number one problem with Daniel as a book is details. And the details become overwhelming. And I think on some level, the details were meant to be helpful, but they're not helpful. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, through through Daniel's life, we follow one man's long career, and it's a career that uh, spans uh, not only time, but also geographical space. Um, and, and we also find Daniel in many different um, cultural contexts. And, uh, and, and it can be just downright confusing. So uh, as an example, what I'm talking about, um, Dad, you like history. Yeah. And so um, if we just think for a minute, uh, can you, you know, approximate for me when the conflict happened with Vietnam and, and who started it? Why did it begin? Who, who were the big players? Well, this is, you know, the, one of the challenges of, of being a historian. Where do you start the story? Uh, the best known, um, I guess, point of reference might be um, you know, for the United States, as we think about the Vietnam War, uh, something like the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution that happened, oh gee, I'm just pulling dates out in the mid 60s. But actually, if you go back uh, the conflict, you could go back to 1954, Dien Bien Phu, when the uh, French were defeated in Indochina and pulled out, America started to move in. And you can even go back earlier into in the, the story. So, you know, when we begin to talk about history, we're talking about lots of movements over time and just kind of depends on where you want to jump into the story. Yeah. So, and who would you say, um, that what president or 
was responsible for Vietnam. Yeah, I mean, so again, historians go back. Um, I think that the easy answer to uh, the escalation of the war in Vietnam would be President Johnson. Mm -hmm. But uh, before but he that, he started uh, the JFK. J John F. Involved. Kennedy was was very much involved um, in in the movement toward more and more involvement. And as I said, Dien Bien Phu was, uh, I think, 1954. I might be wrong, but. Uh, the mid 50s, and, and that takes us back into the administration uh, of, of President Eisenhower, and, and even further back into President Truman. So all, all of these people had their sort of right. fingers and, in that. And it goes on into Nixon's. Nixon terms was the, as well. That's he's the one that finally got the United States pulled out yeah. in the 1970s. So again, it depends on you know what part of the war and and, you and know, just, just specifically what you're looking at. And just out of curiosity, you know, it's not just presidents. These are, you know, uh, products of big political machines. You know, who were some of the congressional leaders who were maybe big uh, voices? In the Vietnam. And this might be proving my point. Yeah. If you don't know, it's okay. <laughs> well, you know, John Foster Dulles was certainly uh, influential uh, um, in the 1950s of, of this idea of containment of, of um, communism and how to battle com communism, um, and uh, then McNamara going into uh, Johnson's administration. I mean, that's a, a whole nother story. He was an executive with Ford Motor Company, um, you know, and the Johnson administration felt like they could deal with a war as a, a technical issue um, and a, a management issue. And so they brought in a great management expert in Robert uh, McNamara. Uh, but, you know, there McNamara was just kind of picking up the pieces of, of policy that was distracted in Europe, distracted in Cuba, all over the place, so many things were happening. And so here you get, again get this sort of tumbling of figures mm -hmm. that come in and out. And these, uh, you know, like you say, the Secretary of Defense uh, probably has as much to do with policy making in Vietnam as, as the president themselves. They were the ones feeding the information. Yeah. So this is a little bit of a digression, but I brought That's it up. a lot of a digression. But I brought it up to prove a point. Details aren't always helpful. Right. Um, you know, when we look back, we can think about all the characters that are uh, important to any one story. Um, but we realize quickly that when we're talking about these huge uh, scales of activity, something as big as an international conflict um, between superpowers. Certainly Vietnam's not a superpower, but Vietnam is part of a communist uh, yeah, it was, block. Is a, it is part of a superpower war. Uh, the, the, the war in Vietnam was a proxy war between right. the United States, Russia, and China. It's, yes. Those are all players, and that's how Nixon got us out of it, by the way, just yeah. kind of playing off people. Yeah. But, but when things this big are happening, when the world is this tumultuous, um, we can try and go in and, and explain with specific names, specific dates and everything, but that gets really confusing. It really does. And it's easy to lose track, and especially after a little bit of time, it can get really confusing. And it's easy for people to misremember. And which I probably did. So if there are any historians out there that I offended, and I left out the biggest name of all, Henry Kissinger. Um, <laughs> but this gets us back to the manual. Yeah, it gets us and back the to the And the problem with details. I think there is a certain way that we can try and, uh, and approach the book of Daniel, and we can try and keep up with all these names. We can try and figure out Nebuchadnezzar. Is this the Nebuchadnezzar, whose name is actually Nebuchadrezzar? Um, Hebrew form, I guess, would be Nebuchadnezzar. Um, uh, who is this Belshazzar? Um, who is uh, Darius? Who is Cyrus? Uh, the book keeps on talking about Medes and Persians. H how do we try and keep all these details straight? And it can become absolutely maddening. Yeah. Because in in a in a very well uh, real way, the the world that is reflected when we talk about something as tumultuous as the middle of the 20th century. The movement of power, politics, all this kind of stuff is, is the world that Daniel was inhabiting. Yeah. It, was a, it was a shifting world 
a world of mega powers who were quickly reaching zenith and then falling in the middle of the night kind of stuff. And Daniel's riding all of these waves. Yeah. So um, a, a big, a basic outline uh, for Daniel's story is we're told that he is uh, one of the exiles that is taken from Jerusalem um, when the Babylonians um, go into Jerusalem and, and take exile out. This is before the destruction. And then that's even a complicated story because you, you get the fall in what, um, 586, 87, but they're taking it's out eggs. Yeah, or it's early, in early yeah, in the 90s, they're taking out exile. Yeah. So this is a period of time as well. It is. And Daniel's on that first wave. And this is another thing where we get ourselves into trouble because Daniel's career will go all the way into the 530s. So if he's taken as a working adult in the five um, nineties, in the five nineties, and then somehow he's still operating in the five thirties, it raises all kinds of questions. This is why the details are not helpful. Yeah. Um, but the big story is that Daniel is one of these people who is Jewish, comes out of Jerusalem, and comes into the service of the Babylonian um, bureaucracy. The Babylonians are the empire that take over for a couple of generations. And, uh, and then as we continue to follow Daniel's career, the Babylonians fall to another superpower. Again, it's this incredibly unstable period in history where all the stakes are high. Mm. Um, and when you win, you win big. And when you lose, you lose big. Um, so after the, the Babylonians fall, the Persians come in. And we read in the beginning of the book of Daniel that while he's in the service of the Babylonian king, Daniel distinguishes himself as a man of wisdom. Um, again, very similar to Joseph. Also a, a man of, uh, of unique understanding and insight. And uh, like Joseph, Daniel has the power of understanding dreams. And so um, Daniel becomes a, a, a trusted person um, within the Babylonian um, bureaucracy. And Daniel maintains his position and his, uh, I guess his reputation precedes him when the Persian government comes, comes in to replace the Babylonian government. And Daniel maintains this position. Um, and I think this is one of the things that is attractive to Daniel throughout the ages, particularly for us, uh, I think a lot of Protestant evangelicals really love Daniel because he's successful. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, Daniel's good in the boardroom, and uh, he's a powerful guy, and he he did it by himself. He did it, you know, by his uh, amazing abilities. <laughs> right. And his his hard work, his good work ethic. Um, and so that's kind of the setup for the story that we find um, with Daniel and Lions Den. So you say that Daniel did it alone, but not quite, because in this episode, we're gonna find out he has sort of another source, and it's a source of that wisdom, source of insight, uh, and he's depending on that heavily. So what is that source? Absolutely, so um, again, I think, that, again, the problem with details, we can get ourselves into trouble when we try and put stuff together too closely. And um, we can get ourselves into trouble when we misunderstand who Daniel is. Um, we might, be prone to think about Daniel as the successful person, but that's really not the way the book of Daniel puts Daniel forward. Mm -hmm. He is an influential person, but that's not what's on Daniel's mind. Um, so in chapter six, Daniel has uh, continued to excel, um, use his gifts well for the people that he works for. The Persian king, um, not the Babylonian king, but the Persian king, has promoted Daniel to oversee his governors, and the governors don't like this. Mm. And this is similar to last week when we were talking about Esther's period of incredible ambition, characters like Haman. Um, these, uh, these governors, satraps is the fancy word for Persian governors, decide to get rid of Daniel. And they can't find any way uh, to bring him down because he's an honest guy. Right, right. Imagine like that. Yeah, yes. he's a lot like Joseph. 
and like Esther, I mean, they, these are people, or Mordecai, yeah, integrity, Mordecai, yeah, they're absolutely. watching out for, for folks and being good people. Yeah, and they decide if there is any way that we're going to be able to get rid of Daniel, we're going to have to figure out a way to make his faith work against him. Wow. We will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. And that is verse 5 of chapter 6. So they hatch this plan that they will float a rule to the Persian king, a lot like the story of Esther, um, uh, that people will only be allowed to pray to, to the king, I guess. Yeah. And yeah. anybody who's caught praying to anybody else will be um, subject to the death penalty. And it's this awful death penalty, death by lions. So, um, you know how the story goes. Daniel is torn because he is a man of prayer. And we find out, you know this, that, that Daniel's source of power is his relationship with God, his special relationship with God. Mm. And so, um, forced with the, um, the options of either not praying to God, the, the, the Hebrew God, the Lord anymore, or doing this somehow in, in secret, Daniel decides that he's not going to do that. He's can, going to continue to daily pray. And it's interesting to me that um, Daniel's habit is to pray in his apartment, and he prays with the windows open, and he always prays facing Jerusalem. What do you think about that? Is that weird? It's, well, it, it, it's not weird, I think, because, again, uh, here we have Jerusalem being raised, the, the temple being destroyed, but that strong sense of uh, the Hebrew people that, that God is residing in that temple, God, that city is a special city in spite of its being raised. And so Daniel is facing back toward the temple. Yeah, and uh, what you just said is interesting. The devil is in the details. Um, Daniel is directing his prayers geographically towards this place that is dear to his heart. Interestingly, it's actually the Persian kings who send people and money back to Jerusalem to have the temple rebuilt. Right. And this is another devil in the details. We don't, Daniel doesn't talk about that. But we do know that the people that he's working for in Persia are the same people who have sent back people like Zerubbabel and uh, Ezra and Nehemiah to rebuild the temple. Yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, we know how the story goes. It's a trap. The, the officials bring, drag Daniel before the king and they um, say, this man was praying, you have to punish him. The king is distraught because Daniel is an honest, uh, good overseer. Um, the king doesn't want anything bad to happen to Daniel, but the king's creed cannot be taken back. We talked about that last week with Esther as well. So, so the king has kind of been played here. They've... Yes played on his ego, they played on his distraction, and so the king goes for this plot, and then he thinks, oh no, what have I done? I've, I've... And it's exactly like Esther last week. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to take out the one guy that I can trust. Yeah, and the, simple is, the story is actually shockingly simple. Um, there's not a lot of details to catch in the story. Daniel has to be thrown in the lion's den. Uh, the king is upset about it. The king can't eat or think all night. He wakes up first thing in the morning and says, Daniel, are you okay? And Daniel says, yeah, I'm okay. <laughs> my, my God shut the mouths of the lions. Yeah. I'm fine. And, uh, and uh, kind of the, the point of the story, if we're just reading chapter 6, is that the Persian king is glad to have Daniel back and then makes those bad officials pay by throwing them and their families into the lion's den. Mm. And no mercy is given um, the lions were say, eat them before they even hit the floor. So um, that's a weird kind of story. And again, very similar along the lines of Esther last week. Meant to be the destruction of God's people. And instead, the destroyers are destroyed. Mm. So we have this idea of providence at right. work in, in the book of Daniel as well. And we really see this developing a lot in this literature that's coming out of the exile, coming right. out of the Babylonian and Persian experience. So one of the things that interests me about Daniel, and it's not the, the details about what king is this or what year might this be, not even so much what are, what are the visions referring to in specific uh, 
historical events. But one of the things that interests me is, is this theme uh, that is being tossed around that seems to be really heavy on Daniel's heart. A, a person formed by prayer. Prayer is what gets Daniel into trouble in chapter 6. His devotion to keeping a personal connection with God through prayer. Um, but we're not given in chapter 6 what Daniel prays about. Daniel is not recorded as having prayed in the lion's den. We're not given any prayers that says that Daniel stayed up all night praying to God. That, that's not a sentence. That's not a verse that we're given. Instead, we read that Daniel's insistence on praying towards Jerusalem every day is what gets him in trouble. trouble right. <laughs> if we want to find out what Daniel is praying about, we have to look in other parts of the book. And a really good example is in chapter 9. Um, this is, again, Daniel in service of the Persian king. Um, it starts off by saying that Daniel uh, says that I have been reading out of Jeremiah. And remember, Jeremiah writes mm. from Jerusalem as things are falling apart. So this would have been uh, many years before Daniel in service of the Persian kings. Um about 50 years before Daniel in the service of the Persian kings. Um, Jeremiah is writing about what's going to happen to the people in Jerusalem. Jeremiah's career is 40 years. The last 40 years of the kingdom of Judah is Jeremiah's career. Mm. And uh, Jeremiah gives all these warnings. And then when people don't hear the, heed the warnings, God begins to start giving messages of hope as well. Hope for the remnant. And it's in Jeremiah that uh, this idea of 70 years begins. Mm -hmm. God says, my people will be in exile for 70 years. So lo and behold, we have Daniel who's coming to this point. The, the time is coming up and Daniel gets very interested. And we begin to get an insight into what Daniel has been thinking about all these years. Daniel in the service of the kings in Babylon. Daniel in the service of the kings in Persia. And Daniel doesn't seem to have been thinking about his own advancement. Daniel doesn't seem to have been thinking about his own ambition. When Daniel prays, he doesn't pray that he can do a good job. Daniel seems to have been worrying this whole time, what's going to happen to your people, God? Mm. And what does it mean that we were destroyed in the first place? I think one of the most helpful things that I've read over the past few days about Daniel is this big picture idea that the big question in Daniel, in Daniel's time, is um, why did God allow his people to be destroyed? Does that mean that God doesn't have the power to protect them? Mm. Does that mean that the gods of Babylon are more powerful than the God of Israel? And does that mean that the gods of Persia are more powerful than both of them? Because Persia's on top now. And that's a legitimate question. You know, we can talk about faith and ideas and hope all day long, but uh, when we're looking in front of us and it's life and death and it's going back to Vietnam, it's raw military power. These questions come up. Yeah, I mean, I, I can really identify. I mean, here, here are a people who for centuries have understood themselves to be God's special people with a mission in the world, and all of a sudden their mission is is cut short and, and they are, are on the verge of not even being a people anymore. They have no place until the Persians send them back. But, you know, wrestling with this identity question and these power questions, I think, wow, I can identify with that. But help me here just for a second. I mean, when you said uh, Daniel and, and many others were, mm -hmm. were asking these questions, well, where is God when these things happen? I, I, I guess maybe that was a more religious time, but asking questions like, well, you know, is God real? Is, is our God powerful? The gods of Babylon, the gods of Persia, how does that work out in today's, I mean, I just think, I just have such a burden for the 30-somethings of our, our yeah. era. What, what are their questions right. related to well, that? Well, and let me back out and make this, you know, very uh, real historically. Um, 
we are a more secular society, yeah, and, yeah. and that's not a part of ancient life. You don't find secular ancient people. It just doesn't exist. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, one of the practices, one of the pieces of propaganda for any of these major, major political powers is to uh, enforce your power uh, in terms of religion. Our gods are better than your god. Realistically, what that looks like is our guns are bigger than yours, mm -hmm. but the way that it plays out is our gods are better than your gods. So when the Babylonians conquer the Assyrian Empire, they make it very clear that the god Marduk, our god, is more powerful than your god Ashur. You can read this in ancient inscriptions. And when Cyrus comes in, or uh, when the Persians come in, the Persian kings, they pull an even more interesting thing. They don't say that our gods are more powerful than your gods. They say that your gods like us better than they like the old king. <laughs> oh, I love that one. And, the, and, and so in all of the royal inscriptions of the kings of Persia, everywhere that they go, they write these letters. The king, the, your god Marduk has rejected the Babylonian king and has chosen us to rule in his place. So it, it is very real. This idea of power is linked um, in a spiritual way. Well, so, so given and, that those tapes playing, I imagine that tape could get translated into the, the Hebrew mindset, you know, our God likes you better, or, you know, we're, we're out of disfavor, or, or something well, like that. Well, this, so. this is where it gets really interesting, and we're going to hop into it here in a minute. You asked, though, how does it play out today? I think while we're secular people, we're not faithless. Yeah. And I think that's one of the great lies that our culture and media want to tell us is that if you don't believe in God, then then you're not a person of faith. That's not true. I think that uh, materialism, atheism, um, pure hedonism are also acts of faith. And they're based on the presumption, the act of faith that there is no God, which is as big an act of faith as to say that there is a God. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And so I think that's the great lie that we're being told today is that, that there is no need for religion. There is no God. If there is a God, it's not important. He just wants to make you sad. Um, what there is, as, is you pursuing you. And that's David Brooks's big thing. As it turns out, us pursuing us is a lousy life. Yeah. And it doesn't give people anything to live for, and they throw in the towel really quick. And so, but we have these options today. One of them is hedonism, materialism. <laughs> Uh, that works out in the West. Or this moron belief that the future of humanity is to live on Mars or to be stored in a computer database. Yeah, I mean this... Which is purely pathetic, but is, you know, preached hard from on high and lots of people believe it. Yeah. And, but, and then also we have the more realistic part of the world. I think we see that played out in the cynicism of Russian and uh, Chinese Absolutely. aggression right now. Um, the, the tag of communism has dropped, but... Um, still this sort of rampant nationalism. And that's a tape that plays in the United States as well. Absolutely. Uh, nationalism. Um, when the, you find the people in the church standing up and saying, Jesus is a softy, Jesus is a sissy, we don't want Jesus, we want our version of Christianity, and it'll come with guns. Yeah. That's, uh, that's a shocking thing, but it has happened over the past few years and it does continue to happen in some church circles. So we've got this, again, babble, this confusion of, of conflicting power claims, I think more than truth claims, and that's certainly part of Daniel's world. And so there is this reflection on what, how- What just happened? Yeah, what, what, and what, what is our place? Yeah. Well, what does it happen? What does it mean that we, are in a vulnerable position that we lost, does that mean, God, that you're a loser? And all of this comes out, you know, Daniel's been thinking about this, lots of people have been thinking about this, and Daniel's prayer in chapter 9 is really interesting. We're not going to read it right now. We're going to talk about it Sunday, but this is the gist of it. It's a long prayer of confession. Yeah. Daniel said, I got into the book of Jeremiah, and I understand that this stuff didn't happen because of God's inability. It happened because of our inability. And this is the message that Jeremiah tried so hard to share with his people and that they refused to listen to. Even as they were leaving Jerusalem in chains, they refused to listen to him that it was their fault. But this convicts Daniel's heart. Mm. 
And Daniel begins to pray a prayer of confession. God, this is how we messed up. Please have mercy on us. Wow. It's extraordinary that this man, who is number three in, uh, in control of <laughs> the Persian Empire, this man who is successful, good in the boardroom, uh, when we get an insight into his prayer life and what does he care about and what does he say, his prayer is, oh my God, we failed you. We have messed up. Please forgive us. And please tell me, please give me understanding. Is there a future for us? Mm. And then the second half of the book of Daniel is preoccupied with these visions that Daniel is given. And uh, Daniel has conversations with, with messengers from God. The word that we use for messenger from God is angel. Um, where they encourage Daniel, yes, there is a future. Mm. And uh, the amazing thing about the book of Daniel is it, and the uh, visions that Daniel's given, the message that he's given, is it completely opens this horizon um, for God's people to see the world in a new way. It's not the old way that if God likes us, we'll be fat and sassy in Jerusalem. And if God doesn't like us or isn't real, then we'll be wiped out. Mm. It's God is in control of things in ways that you don't understand. And this is bringing us back to the themes from Esther last, from last week as well. Um, this strong assurance that God is in control. And you won't always see it. It's the movement of superpowers. Um, it's the rise and fall of empires. But the encouragement through all of it is God saying, I am in it. I am behind it as the kings rise and fall. They are doing my bidding and they don't even know it. And in the end of all of it, there will be a place for my people and there will be a place for my future. Mm. And, uh, and I think as a, an insight to that, the joke is that the kings of Persia who might think that they're being smart by saying, your God likes us better, um, actually end up fulfilling their prophecy in ways they didn't know. Uh, Isaiah will go ahead and call one of the Persian kings Messiah. And God does use the Persian kings to send the Jewish people home, to reestablish the temple. And they don't just send them home and say, good luck. They send them home with money and resources. Take what you need. Do a good job. Rebuild the walls to your city. And, uh, and in fact, um, after you can read in Ezra and Nehemiah, um, after there's initial um, uh, opposition from the neighbors around Jerusalem to the, to the walls being rebuilt, um, it's all worked out, and the Persian kings say, no, we want you to rebuild your walls. And God does end up using them. They may not have thought that they were uh, under anybody's thumb, the Persian kings are the one who really start using the king of kings and lords of lords. That's their title originally. We know it from Revelation to refer to Jesus, but the Persian kings are like to call themselves the king of kings and the lord of lords. They might not have thought they were anyone above them, but uh, <laughs> we find out through these insights given to Daniel that God says, no, I, I am their king and I am their lord and they will do my bidding. And it's going to be okay, Daniel. So I, I just, I can't get over the, the relevance of the book of Daniel to the world, at least I feel like I'm living in, this world of superpowers, all of these power claims that are going on today. And, 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 and again, stuff that is not just a, a, a mental exercise, but life and death, blood is on the line. Yes, in, in, our, in our world today, very much uh, blood on the line. And, and the church dispirited, um, I would say, oh, uh, yeah, if I could describe the, the church today, it would be the church is in exile, in, yeah. in my opinion. Um, there is a, a faithful remnant, it's very few, it's easy to be in despair, it's easy to say, where is God, who does God like, or what God is better. What and future I've, can there be? What future can there be? And I think, you know, we see so many churches chasing the cultural gods, of the or, right, the left. Or chasing the past that doesn't exist anymore or and won't exist again. Yeah, and nostalgia, the God of nostalgia. 
And, and so, you know, we're, we're in this place and, and the answer seems to be from Daniel, confession. Yeah, in this, the midst this of heart it. after God, this person who prays facing Jerusalem every day, this is what, this is what the Holy Spirit brings him to. Confess and then take this message of hope. Yeah, that, that's an interesting outcome. You know, I, I, I expect, you know, okay, sort of this again, this slot machine kind of faith. We confess and boom, revival's gonna happen. Boom, you know, it's gonna turn around tomorrow. But instead, Daniel is given this, this kind of long vision into the future <laughs> that assures him that God is in control. There is a future and it's good. And I guess also, Nathaniel, I'm surprised in, in talking about this, that most of the biblical prophecy that I, I find coming out of the book of Revelation, it, it, people might think it's hopeful, I suppose, but most of it is just downright depressing. I mean, there's going to be this end. There's going to be, you know, fire and burning and all this kind of stuff. And, well, then God's going to come get us and rescue us or something. I mean, it, it's... The, the modern prophecy, this dispensationalism, to me, is not hopeful. It is not hopeful. It's, um, it's fatalistic. It's, it's just um, uh, not good news. But the book of Daniel comes and brings us this good news. Absolute good news. God yeah. has a future, and God is working in ways that we don't always understand. Um, and, and this is the gift. I mean, this is a pivotal period in, in the life of God's people. It, 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 and it's the one that ultimately will allow for Jesus to arrive. You know, it's interesting, that whole idea that it's in the fullness of time that Jesus comes. Um, God had to prepare the ground. God had to prepare people's minds and expectations. I work in ways that you're not going to understand. Mm, very good. Well, Nathaniel, thank you. I'm, I'm excited about Sunday. I'm excited about Daniel, the book, and want to know more about it. I'm excited about prayer. Um, and this idea of confession, it's really challenging. So How do we embrace that in our culture today? Well, and, and, and what does it look like to have a real heart for God? And what does it look like to have a heart for God's people? And I think that's a big question today, too. Yeah, not confession is manipulation, but but really heartfelt com well, confession. Well, not going and punching people in the face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just a real compassion yeah. uh, and love for God's people and concern for God's people as well as the love for God. Well, and, and a willingness to take responsibility. Um, that's another hard lesson. Wow. Looking forward to Sunday. Um, as we close, Nathaniel, could you just maybe close us with prayer this week? And um, this is a lot to pray about as we think about our confused culture, our role, our confession, all of this. Um, it's going to be great to, to kind of live with this for a while and let it sink in. Yeah. Have to pray for us. Father, thank you um, for your words and thank you for your story. Uh, we know that the old maxims history might not repeat itself word for word but it does rhyme and we do see the patterns not just in the way that human beings work but in the way that you work um, and we give you thanks for this story of a faithful person daniel because when we look at the world around us it, it rhymes with the world that he knew one with incredibly high stakes um, one that is very unpredictable and one that weighs heavy on our conscience and on our souls. One that has a unique ability to raise a lot of questions about the scope of your power, the scope of your interest, if you exist at all. So thank you for this witness uh, of the way that you have provided for your people in the past. Thank you for the promise of your future provision and we pray that you would form us into a kind of people like you did Daniel, who are willing to lay ourselves down, yes, to continue our, our own professional lives, but, but at our core to be oriented towards you, to be servants for your people above everything. That's a big thing to ask, but your people need it. So we ask it. Keep us safe till we meet again. Amen. Amen. Great, Nathaniel, thank you. Thank you for joining us, and we look forward to catching you again very soon. Good night.